Gate disturbance. General features. The common causes of gate disturbance together with their main characteristics are shown in Table 15. General observation on introduction to the patient may yield some clues to the diagnosis. Parkinson's disease is suggested by the patient looking hypomimic, paucity of facial expression, blinking infrequently and having difficulty holding saliva in the mouth due to a poor swallow frequency. Careful observation of the hands may reveal an asymmetrical 3 to 6 Hz resting pill rolling tremor. The patient with cerebellar ataxia may infrequently have a head tremor or titubation and an intention tremor in the arms on shaking hands, and may also have a slurring dysarthria. The patient with peripheral neuropathy may have wasting in the hands and be wearing bilateral splints or ankle foot orthoses. Diffuse cerebrovascular disease is often associated with a dementia when severe enough to cause gait impairment and the patient may have a pseudobulbar palsy with dysarthria. Neurological examination. The patient should be asked to walk a distance of at least 10 m as normally as possible. Make sure that you walk alongside the patient if he or she appears to be very imbalanced. Based on this inspection the most probable diagnosis should be made and then corroborating signs sought on examination. Is it Parkinson's disease? Look specifically for these features, remembering that many of them may be asymmetrical. Gait is typically short-stepped, shuffling and festinant, with reduced or absent arm swing. In early disease, a slight reduction in arm swing on one side may be the only abnormality. Freezing of gait occurs later in the disease. The patient will often have problems initiating walking, but once started has difficulty stopping. Posture is flexed, stooped, and when severe is referred to as simian. Hypomemia, i.e. paucity of facial expression with mask-like facies and a reduced blink rate. The rest tremor of the hands is classically pill rolling and most marked at rest. It is best seen with the hands resting, palms facing inwards, on the lap or over the edge of an armchair. The tremor may be intermittent and if not seen can be elicited by mental distraction, such as counting backwards from 20, or it often comes on with walking. It is typically asymmetrical. Tremor seen in the legs is highly suggestive of Parkinson's disease. Tremor may also occur in the chin, neck, and tongue. Bradykinesia, i.e. slowness, and fatigability of rapid movements. Ask the patient to open and close each hand as widely and as rapidly as possible, or to tap the thumb of one hand with each finger of the same hand in rapid succession with the widest amplitude possible. If not obviously slow, then continue this exercise at least 10 times to demonstrate decrement in rate and amplitude. An extrapyramidal syndrome cannot be diagnosed without this feature. Extrapyramidal rigidity with cogwheeling, i.e. the combination of rigidity and tremor, is best demonstrated by slow and gentle rotation of the wrist. Ask the patient to write a phrase such as Mary had a little lamb several times looking for the development of micrographia. Ask the patient to draw a spiral, which may demonstrate tremor as well as micrographia. Note that the glabella tap, which involves tapping the glabella and observing whether the patient blinks, is a nonspecific test that is not clinically useful, although it used to be said that failure of this response due to fatigue, i.e. blinking stops with repeated taps, indicated Parkinson's disease especially in younger patients. Drug-induced Parkinsonism may appear clinically identical, although it tends to be more symmetrical. Wilson's disease may present with Parkinsonism and is associated with Kaiser Flace rings, usually only visible with a slit lamp. Is it cerebellar disease? The following are features of cerebellar disease. Titubation, head tremor, is uncommon. Dysarthria, scanning speech. 
nystagmus, horizontal and jerky, and jerky pursuit eye movements. Limitaxia, upper limb, failure of rapid alternating movements, intention tremor and dysmetria with past pointing, and lower limb, heel shin ataxia, wide based gait and inability to perform heel toe walking. Is it peripheral neuropathy? The neuropathy may be a polyneuropathy, which will lead to symmetrical signs in a glove and stocking distribution, or less commonly is due to bilateral mononeuropathies affecting the common peroneal or sciatic nerves, which are more likely to be asymmetrical. The patient's gait is often high-stepping as a consequence of both bilateral foot drop and sensory loss. The main findings include Wasting distally in the legs, feet and hands. Possible fasciculations if there is axonal loss. Atrophic changes in the skin, edema too, purple, hairless, and pigmented, due to loss of autonomic and sensory fibers. Ulcers associated with pressure points, heel, between toes, and sacrum. Reduced tone, although this is often difficult to differentiate from normal. Distal weakness, foot drop and hand weakness. Reduced or absent reflexes. Glove and stocking sensory loss. Is it diffuse cerebrovascular disease? Patients with either bilateral large vessel frontal infarcts or subcortical ischemic leukoencephalopathy may have a frontal apraxic gait, which characteristically leads to a march a petit pas appearance and is commonly mistaken for the gait of Parkinson's disease. In march a petit pas, the steps are small, broad based stuck to the floor and shuffling. Turning requires several steps and there may, in contrast to Parkinson's disease, be excessive arm swing. The stance is upright with the center of gravity being normal, as opposed to shifted forwards as in Parkinson's disease. There is often poor gait initiation, but this is also seen in Parkinson's disease. In the patient with diffuse cerebrovascular disease there are often symmetrical extrapyramidal signs that are more severe in the legs than the arms or face. March a petit pas is therefore sometimes termed lower body Parkinsonism. There is no resting tremor and the bradykinesia is symmetrical. The rigidity seen with frontal lobe disease, sometimes called Gagan-Halton, is often due to poor attention and not due to a true increase in tone. Other diseases that can cause a frontal apraxic gait include hydrocephalus and subdural hematomas, these should be considered in any patient, especially if the gait disorder is isolated. Is it myopathic? Look for the following features. The patient may have myopathic facies with wasting of temporalis and muscles of mastication. Waddling gait Failure to stabilize the pelvis caused by predominant involvement of pelvic girdle and proximal leg muscles. Wasting of affected muscle groups. Usually more prominent proximal weakness, distal myopathies are rare apart from myotonic dystrophy. Reflexes are preserved until there is severe muscle wasting. No sensory signs. Is it a spastic gait? In unilateral upper motor neuron syndromes, the gait is stiff with circumduction and toe dragging of the affected leg. When bilateral upper motor neuron lesions occur, both legs are stiff and patients develop a scissoring gait. The common signs are Spastic tone, pyramidal weakness, brisk reflexes, and extensor plantar responses all upper motor neuron signs. There may be a sensory level when there is spinal cord disease. NB. In routine clinical practice, do not forget to look beyond the neurological system for important diagnostic clues. Does the patient look as though he or she has lost weight? Is there lymphadenopathy? Are there masses in the breast? or on abdominal and rectal examination. Is the chest examination normal? If metastatic disease is suspected, 
which may apply to some cases of cerebellar, neuropathic, spastic or myopathic gait disturbance, then a full systemic examination should be performed. If vascular disease is suspected, then a full cardiovascular assessment is required, including heart rhythm, murmurs, brutes and evidence of hypercholesterolemia and chronic smoking. Further discussion The differentiation of frontal gait apraxia and idiopathic Parkinson's disease can sometimes be difficult, especially in the elderly where the two diseases may coexist. Patients who have Parkinson's disease and have been treated for it can sometimes be difficult to assess blindly without the history, but the presence of only extrapyramidal signs and the predominance of upper limb and face involvement should make the diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease clearer. <laughs>